welcome to Crack, Crack, Creativity, Resolution, Art, Illness, and Community. Uh, this is our No Silence, No Shame webinar. Um, I'm very happy to uh, be um, sharing this with all of you today. Uh, this is being recorded on February 9th um, as I speak. And we will look forward to the listeners' ideas and feedback and comments and how you can share your idea and ideas and feedback and comments with us. Um, you'll have that information at the end. But I'm going to now um, proceed. I'm Patricia Fennell. I have been working um, in the areas of chronic illness and trauma, and forensics, and hospice care uh, for start some years, and I have for a long time been very interested in what are our capacities, what are the things that help us then develop uh, meaning and give us uh, understanding about things that we have suffered in our lives and that other people have suffered. Um, and how do we go forward with that um, in our lives? And for this particular webinar, I have two wonderful guests. Uh, the first, my first guest, um, and of course we'll all be talking together shortly, is um, David Kaczynski. And uh, he has done a lot of interesting in work. Um, he has worked very hard in his life to oppose uh, issues of uh, violence and coercion. Um, he has, uh, well, Dave, let me uh, give you a chance to say a little bit about uh, your story, what, what brings you to this work. Uh, you've worked with me in these webinars before. Um, say a little bit about uh, your interest here. Sure. Our family was involved in a very high-profile uh, criminal trial, a death penalty trial um, involving my brother Ted, who's also known as the Unabomber. And unfortunately, he didn't get the death penalty. And uh, coming out of that, uh, you know, that trial and that uh, the trauma for our family that was, you know surrounding that, that whole series of events, I was really looking for a kind of meaning in my, in my own life and what to do with this. And one of the things that occurred to me was that I'd always been very, very opposed to the death penalty. Um, I right. thought it was awful that my brother, as a mentally ill person, would be subject to the death penalty. And uh, so even though he didn't get, get it, I, I kind of decided that I wanted to spend a good part of my life opposing the death penalty. Mm -hmm. um, our family had gotten involved in, a, in another family's case out in California, the Babbitt family. Um, unfortunately, we were not successful in um, avoiding the execution of, of, uh, of Manny Babbitt. However, through that process, uh, my wife Linda and I became very good friends with Bill Babbitt and his wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1999, I was actually invited to a, a large national conference of death penalty abolitionists run by the National Coalition to the death penalty in Philadelphia, and I didn't know anybody there. I was kind of overwhelmed and felt quite alone. And I remember one evening, um, as the you know the, the day's events were winding down, uh, a gentleman came up to me and said, "Hey, hey, David, why don't you join us for dinner?" And uh, that is actually uh, our other person on this call, uh, Rennie Cushing. And I really didn't know much about Rennie or his organization, but right. um, as we sat down to dinner, I realized here I was, the family of a very high-profile offender, someone who had murdered people, uh, surrounded by murder victim family members. And I just felt like of all the people at this conference, these folks who had lost so much mm -hmm. um, to someone like my brother were the ones who had surrounded me and, uh, uh, you know, reaching out to me to include me in their community. And that, that, was, that was how Rennie and I met. And... Uh, why we've become friends for so many years now. A really an extraordinary meeting. And let me, let me uh, move on then, thank you, Dave, to um, let me introduce Rennie. Uh, uh, Rennie, you've been a lifelong activist, social justice activist, um, and a former three-term member of the New Hampshire House of Representatives. Um, and you are already working on social justice um, issues in your life, and then your dad was murdered in 88. Um, there's a whole variety of experiences that obviously came out of that. 
and uh, you, in, in recent times, um, put together the um, uh, 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 No Silence, No Shame conference. Uh, so, so, Ray, if you could tell me a little bit about yourself, your personal story, and maybe a little bit about the conference, and whatever strikes you that would be helpful to our listeners. Right. Well, you know, my father was shotgun to death in front of my mother in our family home in 1988. Mm -hmm. and at that point, thinking what one should do in the aftermath of uh, homicide ceased to be an intellectual exercise. Instead, it's just part of my life. Um, and I realized that, uh, you know, my experience was different uh, about an hour after my father had died when rather than taking his body to the funeral parlor, uh, I had to watch it being taken away to the medical examiner's office because it was no longer my father's body, but it was a piece of evidence. Uh, right. right. I remember also, you know, trying to figure out how to get my father's blood uh, wiped off the floor and the walls of our home because it was no longer a home. It was a crime scene. And I also remember, you know, a couple weeks after my father was murdered, my mother getting a bill from the ambulance corps for transporting my father's corpse from the home to uh, to the hospital. And it struck me, um, it was rather incredible to think that I could live in a society where someone would send a, a widow a bill who had watched her husband murdered right. for her. Extraordinary. And so that kind of began, you know, that that, that my identity as a, as a victim survivor uh, led me right. to work you know, to try to give meaning to, you know, try to get policies in the state that provided for victims' compensation, uh, for instance. And, um, you know, eventually I, I had, it was easy for me initially to see how my, my family had been impacted by my father's murder and our neighbors in the community. But in time I came to see that people who were impacted by my father's murder included the family of my father's killer. And that mm -hmm. occurred one day when I met, uh, I was in the courthouse one day at a, hearing involving my dad's killer, and there was a person in the back of the room that I didn't know. Someone told me it was the son of my dad's killer. Um, wow. After we, we walked out of the courtroom, and um, we had courthouse, and, and we approached each other in the parking lot, and he began telling, apologizing for my father's murder, and I just simply said that, well, you have nothing to apologize for. Uh, we both lost our father on June 1st. My father was in the grave, and you know, his father was in the jail cell. Uh -huh. And if I could just stay right there, Randy, for one second, that is that's just a, such an extraordinary uh, moment and such an extraordinary leap uh, that you and he did that. Well, in a way, it's not anything that we chose. It chose us. And, uh, right, you know, right. And there was nothing for us to do except acknowledge that we were forever going to be linked by an act of horror. Um, yeah. Yep. You no, know, and in time I came to his, that was my first real conscious thought about what a family of an offender's experience must be like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then I eventually I became, I became involved in the anti-death penalty movement. And when I did so, I came to meet other, I came to interact with families of, you know, death row prisoners. I remember being torn uh, as I listened to a, a mother talk about the loss and the execution of her son, and I could easily see the traumatic grief that she had experienced because it was part of my life too. Wow! Um, and one day I was, you know, I, be, I, I became an advocate for victims like myself who opposed the death penalty, and I had the experience of a you know, being in Atlanta, Georgia, when a, you know, a murder had taken place where a, a man had killed his wife and left behind two two surviving children. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. 20 years later, the state of Georgia is moving to execute this person. Um, I was there to provide support to these two surviving children of the murder victim, um, who are also the children of the offender, who were right. begging the uh, state of Georgia to not to to not not, not kill not kill their father, to break the and cycle that, of violence. And unfortunately, and that, that didn't and, come and to that pass and, and that I, and that speaks to just how multi-generation, how many years, how far those ripples go out between uh, the offender and their and his or her family and in this regard his family and then the victim and their families and the, how they're intertwined over decades. And I was, you know, I was literally standing and playing underneath the, you know, a grove of, of pine trees outside the mm. prison in Georgia with the grandchildren of the woman who had been murdered 
and the same grandchildren of the person who was at the time he, their grandfather was being executed. And I thought, Amazing. what how despair, it was almost an act of how despairing it is that all we could offer this family in the aftermath of one murder is filling another coffin. Right. I, on that, if I could, um, if I, what I'd like to do at this point is uh, share with folks some ideas and some thoughts about um, what are the kind of capacities that uh, we have as human beings that can help us um, in the way that I, I, you know, I'd be interested in hearing Rennie's view and Dave's view. Dave and I have talked about this a little bit before on a couple of occasions. Um, but share these capacities that, in my experience, are part of what allow us to um, uh, take these extraordinarily painful, horrific experiences and turn them into something else. Um, and uh, before I do, there's one other person I would like to just tell the audience about, and that's my um, behind-the-scenes person, uh, and that's Vicki Walker, and she is my uh, uh, co-organizer and my off-screen navigator. And Vicki, if you can just say hi. Hello, everybody. Um, hi, thanks, Vicki. And uh, she helps me out as I move through this. So let me introduce these ideas um, again and, and uh, uh, put them out there in the context of, uh, of, of, this, of this work. Um, and I would, I would offer that when these kinds of traumatic events occur, when these kind and they are perpetrated and they occur and they do spill across uh, uh, families, um, horizontally and uh, vertically through through generations in the way that Rennie just really articulated uh, uh, quite well about being 20 years later and having two sets of grandchildren there on the grounds um, of the uh, prison. Um, that what are, what is it in in terms of of, of uh, capacities of improvisation? Um, what are the creative acts that allow us to think differently? And how do we innovate and think differently? Um, and in my work, I talk about uh, four phases that happen to people, a crisis phase, a stabilization phase, a resolution phase, which is the third phase, which is where we develop meaning and have an opportunity to be more largely creative about what's happened to us, and then an integration phase. But I'm going to just focus on some of these aspects within this third phase. Um, I would argue that improvisation leads to creation and leads to innovation. And in a way that Rennie just talked about, um, he saw an opportunities here um, that led to a creative act. And, and it's probably several, but one of the ones that got my attention was his, uh, the conference of, um, that, that they put together um, of no silence, no shame, of bringing together um, all of the uh, uh, family members. Um, who have survived these acts, and that one of the things that's true is in these situations is that change is inevitable. It can be good or it can be bad, but after events occur, it is in fact inevitable, and improvisation is an opportunity to be creative and to innovate to help us respond to this change, hopefully in a positive way. Um, I would argue, and others would too, that, cr that a creative act is a very powerful stance against helplessness. And to, to, for it to be a, a truly helpful and powerful act, it requires a lot of active reflection about how did we get here, who are we in the circumstances that we're trying to uh, impact or are impacting us, and that we must strive to be authentic as truly ourselves as we know how to be on any given day, which is always difficult. Um, some thoughts about what it means to be authentic. Um, I think it's absolutely necessary to maintain insight about our limitations and our abilities. Speaking for myself, on any given day, what am I capable of? Um, where, where do I fall short? Where can I step up? Um, what's working? What isn't? Um, and this is often difficult. It's very difficult. It's painful uh, to do that psychologically, spiritually, if you will. Um, and I think it's necessary to consistently strive for this authenticity, this, this, to maintain this insight about ourselves. And in that, 
um, there's a, a real level of freedom. Out of that, I, you know, I started thinking about well, what are these capacities that I, you know, I've, I've worked with thousands of, of, of patients and uh, perpetrators and victims and, and however, whatever language you use to describe what people have experienced in these really extraordinary, uh, horrific circumstances often. And what is it about, what are these capacities? And when I say chronic illness here, I'm also, I'm talking about it could be AIDS, it could be families that I've worked with who survived uh, 9-11, but chronic syndromes, uh, chronic experiences, you know, we don't get over murder, we don't get over uh, um, um, having an amputation, we don't get over cancer, we don't get over uh, schizophrenia, so to speak, as individuals or in our family. So um, what is it about the capacities that allow us to uh, create meaning in our circumstances? Um, and this is going to vary by what our discipline is, if we're academic people or, um, uh, you know, how we approach the world either vocationally or professionally, um, what our personality is like and what our circumstances. And, and it, we may have, uh, have a need for different capacities. Are we disabled? Uh, so what are, what are our capacities? How do we discover and define them? Here are the ones that I think are uh, important. This is, you know, feel free to pick the ones that make sense for you, make up ones that work for you. But this one I really learned as a uh, person who experienced a lot of death in my um, uh, early life, uh, in my family, and uh, uh, I learned, and then as a hospice worker, I learned about what does it mean to tolerate ambiguity, the unknown, the unknowable. And that ambiguity is unavoidable. It's unavoidable in daily life, and it's certainly unavoidable in these extraordinary circumstances, uh, traumatic circumstances. Learning how to survive this not knowing. Can I get over this? Can people get over this? Can I forgive? Can I be forgiven? Can I not have PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, in response to what's happened? Will the nightmares stop? Will they continue? What's going to happen over time? And part of the uh, uh, learning how to cope is uh, learning to take the time to be uncomfortable, uh, to get to where you need to be, that it's okay to learn how to do that. And that's, that's hard in our culture to do that. I think of this as learning how to do the emotional heavy lifting. Um, we don't get a lot of encouragement in our culture to learn how to do that. Um, but it's really essential when we, when we are dealing with so much ambiguity. And this, at least for me, has led, led to a little bit of wisdom, certainly. And I think wisdom is appreciating the value of the unknown, the realization that something good can and probably will come of this. Another capacity I think is really essential is to be curious. That change is an opportunity to be curious about what can, can come next. How can this be different? Uh, what can I bring to this? What else is available? Who else is out there? Who else can I meet? Who else? Who else is doing work? Um, I just recently met Rennie. I didn't know about Rennie's work. Um, being open allowed that to happen. And that can potentially lead to more innovation and change. Our culture sometimes squelches children's curiosity and adults' curiosity and wonder and risk taking. Cultures vary in their toleration of curiosity. And it can be influenced by who's allowed to be curious. And it can be influenced by education, gender, race, social class. And curiosity can have positive connotations and negative connotations. Either way, I think it's a really good capacity to try to develop in ourselves. I think it's important to learn how to take risks. Um, I think it's a risk to get started every day, to put the feet on the floor and to see what's going to happen next. However, I certainly think it's real important to think about conscious risk taking as opposed to impulsive risk taking. It's important, I think, to think about taking risks that are informed by our limits and our abilities, as I talked about in the beginning. That isn't impulsive. And when we do that, when we do take a risk, it minimizes our shame, it minimizes embarrassment, it minimizes the fear of failure, which is normal and inevitable. And really, it's always helpful to have an exit strategy if things don't go as planned. Next, I think it's important to, to out of those things come improvisation. If, if we are learning to tolerate ambiguity and sitting in the unknown, 
if we're learning to be cur allowing ourselves to be curious, to ask ourselves questions, what do I think? How do I feel? What what, what am I attracted to? What makes sense here? What doesn't? Um, and then maybe take some thoughtful risk. Um, improvisation begins to arise, and it requires that we, we make a choice. Um, it could be a statement choice. It could be a choice about how we move out into the world, who we choose to talk to, what we choose to do next. That creates a reaction, and then there's a reaction to that reaction between ourselves, with other people. And we choose in that moment, who do we reach out to? What medium will we use to do it? Will it be discussion, advocacy, writing, music? Who, who, do, who do we contact? And you know, do you get the big light bulb? Um, and do you need to? I'm not a great big believer myself in the light bulb. I mean, if you get the real big aha moment, I think that's great. But if you don't, that's, that's, that's OK. I think a lot of change and improvisation occurs in these little teeny tiny increments over time. And out of all this comes innovation. You've taken some risks. You've been curious. You've made some choices. And something happens. There's a result. There's an idea. There's a paragraph, a thought. Um, we, we, I really want to encourage myself and other people to ask for help, get some training, get some instruction, get some assistance, accommodate whatever our limits and abilities are, if they're physical or mental or both. So asking the listeners in general, but also um, uh, you know, for our own thought about you know, as, as uh, uh, Rennie, as, as, as you pulled together some your conference and we're encountering things. Um, just a, a, and you too, Dave. Which of these capacities, um, if they make sense to you, which of these capacities do you think uh, played a strong role in 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 the work that you've been doing? Put that back to to you two guys and I'll give you a chance to think about that or to comment about that. Well, I mean, I I think probably all of them to a certain extent. Are you know contribute to the work that I do, but I, I think that you know innovate is something that um, I find has been really important because in in trying to do this work uh, in opposition to the death penalty and working with uh, families of survivors of both victims of homicide and state execution, it's really going into uncharted waters. Um, yeah. Many, yeah. The, <coughs> You know, the, the, the No Silence, No Shame project was about trying to put a face on executions, uh, on, on, on the cost of executions, to try to say that you know, this, the uh, things just don't end when a person is put to death, that that person leaves behind a you know, sibling or spouse or parent or, or child, um, and they're impacted. And it's, you know, as you said, it's, you know, it, it, it continues into, you know, beyond in generations. But they're largely invisible. Um, in our society, right. we don't want to put it in. So what we have tried to do is to put a, a you know a public face on the uh, on families of executed prisoners, so that we can ask questions like, what is society's responsibility when it kills a parent of a young child, um, and what is that child? Is that child a, you know is that child not a victim when its parents put to death, or somehow did we just just discount and, and toss away? Uh, you know, families of offenders. Um, you know, or somehow do we blame them? You know, do and and if, and if, and if, if I if I could right there is is that to even to frame those questions to talk about saying, um, do we put to death um, a parent of a child who who is an offender? That's a that's a risky statement to make. Um, it's such an important statement to make. And then in 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 starting that dialogue, you're in count, you're encouraging other folks to take that risk with you. Um, and to innovate further. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I have some thoughts here, too. You know, in the past, I've talked a lot about how important I think it is to to tolerate ambiguity. Um, right, but Dave. Today, yeah. in, in this conversation, I'm, I'm struck by the importance of taking risks and going back to that moment when Rennie encountered uh, the son of his father's killer, and there had to be a sense of, you know, of, of, of this, there's a tension here. What do I do? Um, and there are different options. And you know, a lot of people, I think, could have just turned away and avoided the situation because it felt risky. Um, because he had to step out of it, Rennie, in some sense, he had to step out of himself 
to even encounter this other person. Yeah. I also think that if you've been badly hurt, um, showing empathy to another person is itself a risky venture because, you know, they might be unkind to you. They might re-victimize you. You might be hurt again. Yeah, there was and something yet, that, 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 that Rennie, I, if, I, if I could just, for both, for both you, uh, Randy and Dave, that, that, that the issue of risking is you were risking, risking re-traumatization. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's funny because if you think about it, we live in a society where that is, it's extremely competitive. I mean, we've got an adversarial political system. We've got an adversarial criminal justice system. It's really all about competition and conflict. Um, yep. And yet, Empathy is almost the opposite. I mean, the empathetic person is not so likely to interpret human interactions as competitions. Um, right. And right. they're sort of opening themselves and making themselves vulnerable, in that sense, taking a risk. And so um, I think, you know, with empathy and feeling, there is a sense in which we, um, you know, we emanate our feelings, but we also absorb feelings from others. Um, being a feeling person, an empathetic person is almost like breathing. I mean, it's it's sort of emanating out and drawing back in, and um, it's it's like finding a kind of freedom to breathe, to feel um, within the constraints of, of 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 a world that we have now come to see is dangerous and potentially violent and unfriendly. I, I, and a thought that occurs to me for, in both of your work. Uh, Rennie, with 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 your conference, um, uh, no silence, no shame. Dave, the anti-death penalty. This is an effort to uh, make human, to keep this human element, to bring people into a discussion who have been uh, viewpoints uh, they're not being taken care of. We're talking about the families of the perpetrators. We're talking. We're talk this is a very inclusive, to use your word, Dave, empathetic. Um, uh, approach and framework in a context, as you just said, that is incredibly competitive. Uh, you know it, that that there's a lot of industry, if you will, around um, and politics. And you know th that I, I read this really interesting quote the other day. Our former uh, justice um, uh, uh, John Stevens. Um, John Paul Stevens, he, he was quoting somebody else, but he was talking about how the American death penalty had been transformed from this like penal instrument that puts people to death into this huge discourse for political uh, purposes, for cultural purposes, for, um, I mean, it's, it's the whole, all of these issues that you're trying to and working and succeeding and keeping a human face on. As, as you said, Rennie, you know, to put a human face on the experience of these forgotten people um, and, and pulling it out of a kind of a, a very competitive argument and keeping it human. Okay. Yeah, I have to say, to me, in a way, it is almost intuitively is a, a way, uh, you know, a survival response, even in the, 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 the deepest pits of my, you know, traumatic grief, um, you know, I wanted somehow to survive, and part of that is, is realizing that I couldn't change the past. I wish I could, right. but I could make some decisions about how I lived in the future. And because I'm someone who, before my father was murdered, I had opposed the death penalty, and I had a certain set of values that um, by which I wanted to lead my life, I, I came to realize that if I had changed my position on the death penalty, that would only give over more power to the act of murder to the killer, because not only would my father be taken from me, but so too would my values. And I okay, and, 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 and Renny, I'd like to stop you right there and ask you to say that again, because that is such a powerful, important statement. So if you don't mind, and forgive me, mm -hmm. one more time, you realized that in your father's, if they executed him, if they, say if, it again? If, uh, no, that um, I realized that if I had changed my position, Right. Death penalty. If I had become a proponent, if I had wished that my father's killers would be put to death, um, right. That actually would uh, give over more power to the to the act of murder and to the murderers, because not only would my father be taken from me, but correct so would my values. And to me, it was so. So, so I'd already lost my father. I wasn't going right. to lose my values. 
That's a, that's a very that's a very interesting. Dave, what what what's your thought on that? Oh, like Rennie, I had always been opposed to the death penalty. So um, obviously, in my own situation, it was it would have been, um, you know, I I just somehow it was for for me it was a matter of my values becoming real. I mean, I, I saw and embraced them at a much more deeper at a deeper personal. Um, more human level, I guess. Maybe, so, having my so brother, ha having my brother exposed to the death penalty was putting a human face on the death penalty, like I, I had never imagined. On the other hand, realizing that my brother was a murderer also put a put a human face on um, the horror of homicide, like I'd never imagined before. Also, and that's the you know David yep. tested me. What do you do when someone you love has done the unthinkable, the unspeakable, when they've taken another human life, and then right. when you're confronted with that, you know, how do you then in turn try to, you know, save the person that you also that you continue to love, even though they've done the worst possible thing you can imagine? Right, right. So, so, so for Dave, it sounds like for you to to say, I don't want people put to death who have committed murder. Um, is a manifest is, 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 is manifest of the values that I've held all along, and and it is an opportunity to like take. Well, I don't want to think of it as an opportunity per se. It's an extraordinary way to come to an opportunity, but but to say you know this continues on my path. And and for Rennie, it was boy if if I wanted this man to be executed, then I've lost my values too. And that's and it's interesting because those values, Dave, your values, Rennie, your values are, you know, there's an as we know, there's an awful lot of folks in our culture, and and and, and it's examined in different ways, um, who have, you know, and, and I don't know how well folks have examined it. You know, there's this huge emotional power and imagining about killing and death. Um, how do people? You, 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 you know, the, the do they? How many folks do folks see value in revenge? Um, you, you know, how how big a role does that play? In uh, um, I was listening to some proceedings the other day that had happened, and one of the speakers, a politician involved, was saying that it was unimaginable, it was unconscionable that someone who had committed such horrible acts. Uh, to uh, this, gentleman, this, 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 this man, to this woman, uh, and children, that they would be allowed to live. Well, to me, it's not a question of, uh, about, you know, because my, my opposition to death penalty is really, you know, victim-centered. It's, it's about me. It's not a question of whether or not somebody, is, you know, is, is allowed to live. It's whether or not we're, we should be allowed to kill them. Is that something that we want to do? To ourselves, not to the individual. That's that's the that's, that's real. That's that's a very interesting statement r right there. Um, that that what is it? What is it? You know, should they be allowed to live versus should should we be in the killing business? Mm -hmm. um, should, should we be in the and killing I, business? And I do think you know. I, I, it's important to say that everyone's response to having a you know some family member murdered is different, and uh, that there's a broad. You know, people go through changes, and, and um, but at the end of the day, I think what people really want to do is heal, and healing is right. a process, not an event. And I, unfortunately, I think some of our, you know, those politicians uh, who are advocates of the execution solution, solution to victims' pain um, have a profound lack of understanding of, you know, the healing is a process. It's it's not an event. Um, and that's what I, that's one of the reasons I'm opposed to it. It's, it, it's like it's like you know it, it doesn't work, even if you wanted it to work. work. And I think and, for and most of us, it's not just, you know. Oftentimes, people like me get dismissed as sometimes people get dismissed as either you know a psycho or a saint. You know, I must be crazy to not want to have the person who killed my father put to death, or I must be some kind of you know holy person that right. know, that, that makes it too good. The reality is, I'm you know those are, we're neither psychos nor saints. We're just people who have had the unthinkable happen and have come to conclude that, uh, you know, a ritual killing by public employees of the person who took our loved one doesn't do anything, doesn't bring any 
everybody back, and all it does is create another grieving family. You know, in the aftermath of killing, the last thing I want to do is to have some other family know the pain of the funeral parlor and the emptiness of the graveyard. That's not what my values are about, and that's not my vision of the society in which I want to live. I know part of my healing arc has involved um, reaching out to murder victim family members, and you know, mm -hmm. early on, um, Linda kind of, my wife kind of woke me up to the realization that we weren't the only families in pain around what my brother had done, and we wrote letters of apology, and uh, I think we sent about 12 letters out to folks. There were so many victims and victims' families, and only got a couple of responses, and as much as I um, appreciated the responses, they were, they were cautious responses, and it was kind of like I really felt, wow, a lot of worlds got blown apart by my brother's bombs, you know, and it was not going to be easy to reconnect or for me even to have enough of a relationship with those folks ever to, to understand what they were going through. So a lot of my healing has involved reaching out to and becoming friends um, with people who uh, have been victims or family members of victims of violent crimes. And as you probably know, I'm close friends with one of my brother's surviving victims, Gary Wright of Salt Lake City, who's just been a great friend and, and given me a gift of kind of healing and perspective and awareness and consciousness about um, about victimization and, and the long path of healing. The one thing that I've learned, if I, if I could say so, and I, I can't speak for victims like, like Rennie can, but my impression is that um, two things that almost every victim I've met agrees on is one is um, they're very invested in there being no more victims in trying to stop right. the victimization that's going on, and they're also invested in healing for victims. And you know, there's a lot of differences of opinion among victims on issues of the death penalty and the criminal justice system. Um, but increasingly, I'm seeing the victims movement more and more focused on these these issues of preventing violence and healing from violence. Uh, and I want to piggyback on well, I want to piggyback on that and go back to a piece that that, that Rennie said earlier, which is uh, captured it, in, in, which is that healing is not an event; it's a process. And in my work over all these years, part of what I've become acutely aware of is that people really do in the beginning, as, as Rennie said, um, you know, how someone in the crisis phase, as I think of it, is going to experience murder, is going to experience that tragedy. Everyone's going to do it differently, but it's going to be this very acute, acute stage. And the, the, the capacity to tolerate the pain and the capacity to tolerate the ambiguity of that um, is, is, you know, people are not prepared for that even when they're trained professionals. Um, it's, it's extraordinary. And, it, and in that space, uh, that is one of the places, in my experience working with folks, that, that people then turn to drastic measure, action. We have to do something. And it needs to be, uh, it, it, it needs to be something that is large and graphic. And, uh, and some people have a lack of information about understanding that it's not just an event, that drastic action is not going to heal this, that it's a, it's a long process, it's a series of, of, of little events. And some people take advantage of that, it can, can, you know, politically or whatever, to say, no, no, um, this is where we do need to focus on the death penalty as, as a solution, when in fact it does not, in my view, heal. And what I, what I what I, I see the death penalty doing in, is again focusing in upon the offender, upon the, the killer. And um, in some ways, what to me is the great tragedy is when I see family members of murder victims who get so focused upon how their loved one died, is they end up forgetting how their loved one lived, um, and it becomes a process whereby the killer, the act of murder, claims two lives, the person who's in the ground and the person who remains. That having said, it's hard, you know, you can't be prescriptive about it. I'm never prescriptive. And I listen mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, I try to model a response. Um, but I also know, David, that I have more in common with somebody who has had a family member murdered who supports the death penalty 
in many ways than I do with my you know colleagues in the abolition movement who don't have a victim experience but who work every day to stop the death penalty. And it is that sense of you know empathy and solidarity, if you will, that comes from that that pain for which there are no words. And uh, right. that's just um, that's just part of my reality, even as I do even as I work within a, a movement that wants to abolish the death penalty. I want ultimately everyone to heal. Uh, I think I think part of that that's so well stated, and I think uh, part of what's been touched on. And I just want to go back to it is um, when we focus on uh, the perpetrator and putting the perpetrator to death, um, then there's this whole again this whole cast of people immediately who are also um, uh, uh, victims. Um, in addition to the actual person who's dead, the, the spouse, the child, the parent, uh, you know, all of those people, um, and that, and the multi-generational impact of that, and then all of the family members around the perpetrator. I, I want to go back to that. That that these are the these are these they become these, uh, you know, the brother, the sister, the son of the murder victim, the brother, the sister, the son of the uh, perpetrator, and how much they have in common. And they all, it seems in my experience, have degrees of facelessness after the fact. Is that, what, what do you think about that, Dave, Rennie? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that is, that is the reality. You know, and, it, and it's just our reality is that in our society we have a, you know, we have a fascination with violence, um, we end up making killers rock stars. Um, and I use the example, everyone knows the name of Timothy McVeigh, but no one knows the name of a, you know, can name a single one of his victims. And it's really exactly. part of the, you know, the, the offender focus. And what, again, what, what happens is that, uh, you know, we have a criminal justice system that's really focused on winning and losing and punishing. It's not about truth seeking and not about healing. Um, or rehabilitation. Like, yeah, I mean, but that's part, you know, that's just the reality that we have to deal with. And there's a, a whole notion of, um, you know, not just an average terror system, but what Susan Herman calls parallel justice. Mm -hmm. As concerned as we are about, um, you know, finding justice for those who, you know, commit crimes, we also need to be as concerned about finding justice uh, for those who are victimized by crime and identify who survive them? Who, for, who survive the crimes? Right. Who survive the crimes? And we and, and one of the things we need not do is we need to have a community response, and we shouldn't make uh, you know how victims are treated based upon you know who the offender is or you know or was or whether it's been identified. Um, we just need to embrace victims because it's part of one part of creating what. Dr. King used to call, you know, called the beloved community. Um, we right. need to do that. Right. And we don't do right. that. We focus a lot of money on, we spend a lot of money on, you know, on, 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 on prisons. Um, we don't spend much money on helping victims heal. Yeah, I'd right. love to put in a, just a plug for Susan Herman's book. It's so clear. It makes so much sense. And, but it really represents a paradigm shift. Uh, it's called Parallel Justice, and the author is Susan Herman. And mm -hmm. uh, Pat, she's actually coming to... Uh, Albany to give a talk, um, I think on April April 11th at Sage College, and really, um, I think it's really, she's got an extraordinary mm -hmm. message that just sort of looks at the current criminal justice system as, as one that, that uh, really does not commit itself to victims much at all. I mean, there's a lot of lip service about... Um, right. You know, doing this for the victims on behalf of the victims, but there's very little um, real investment in in victims' healing or interests or wishes ultimately. Right. Well, and I think what comes to mind is your your dear friend and my good friend uh, Gary Gary Wright, one of your brother's surviving victims, who who you and I have uh, spoken with and we've spoken in public with. I've heard him and and see if this this jives with your memory, Dave. I've heard him be very eloquent about the years and years and years before, after he experienced the explosion um, and the bombing, and I think there was like nine years, maybe eight, nine, ten years that elapsed before it was connected to um, uh, your brother, 
um, and then and what he went through with the criminal justice system, and he cooperated for fully. He was from a law enforcement family. Um, he really held, you know, those values. But boy, he went through. Aside from the recovery of the injuries, et cetera, he he put in a lot of time and energy. And uh, I, I think does that does that jive with your memory about how much work and effort he? he well, put in? yeah, sure, he he sure did. And it's interesting because at some point, as they were preparing for trial, he was visited by uh, uh, you know somebody from the prosecutor's office, and you know just asked about his opinion on the death penalty. And he said, well, he, he once supported the death penalty, but he didn't anymore. And uh, that was the last time he had got any information from the prosecutors, like the relationship ended. Um, right. Uh, Rennie, I, I, I toot his horn a little bit. He actually, uh, as a legislator, introduced a bill, I think, that was passed to, to give no, it, victims yeah. more of a voice. Well, it basically, it recognizes the, the Crime Victims Equality Act, and, and, it rec and what it does is it prevents or it, it just establishes that uh, victims are entitled to all rights, uh, notwithstanding their perspective in support of or opposition to or neutrality on, on the death penalty. Because when you live in a society that prescribes uh, that the proper response of a, a victim is to you know, want to have an execution and you're opposed to it and uh, you know, a death penalty proceeding is ongoing, um, you find that the, the rights and promises of uh, the victims' movement are oftentimes denied to you. Um, and again, right. it makes your, and, and that is, that's been a consistent policy that I know that I've, since I've been doing anti-death penalty work with the victims' community, we, time and again, we've seen uh, victims, be, you know, it's, it's the denial of the, the, the basic premise under which the victims' movement uh, rest is that all victims are entitled to be treated with dignity, and what right. we see, uh, it's our experience of you know the dignity has been denied to victims who oppose the death penalty, all the way from ranging to you know a, a prosecutor in, in in Philadelphia calling a press conference to you know to condemn the parents of, of a, a woman you know Shannon Sheba who was who was murdered because they opposed the death penalty, uh, you know a, a, a judge threatening to you know, send Suzanne Bosler uh, to jail if she expressed her opinion on the death penalty when she was testifying in the trial of the man who killed her father and, and who, you know, stabbed him. It's seeing uh, people, you know, the land, cousin Audrey Lamb, the husband and the, and the daughter of a, 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 you know, a woman who was murdered, um, not being allowed to appear before the, the uh, pardons and parole uh, board in Nebraska to in support the commutation of the death sentence of their spouse and, and, and mother's killer to, to life without parole, they were, um, you know, they were denied that opportunity specifically because they were not supportive of the death penalty. And somehow, in our society, we equate, uh, the, you know, we, we, we create, you know, good victims and bad victims. Good victims are right. the ones that support the prosecutor and want to have a death penalty. Bad victims are people like me who, right. you know, who, who, who oppose that. And it's a, it's cooperative a and uncooperative. Cooperative right. and uncooperative. Right. And, it, you know, and so, at a so, time when you need, the, la the last thing you need, you're trying to recover yeah. from trauma, you're trying to go forward, to find out that somehow um, not only did your loved one get murdered, but you're a bad victim, your response is, is not the, the proper response, is, a, right. again, robbery victimization. Right, right. So, so, so we have a couple of minutes left here for this part of the discussion. So here's part of what I'm thinking uh, in response to everything we, we've said so far today. Uh, one thought that occurs to me is that on the one hand, uh, you know, the, 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 we have this whole um, one theme, one hand. We have this, this whole cadre, this whole group of people, this whole cohort of people who um, have become victims, either because uh, they are surviving victims of crime, they're, they are family members who have uh, had uh, uh, crime, uh, murder, et cetera, occur in their family. And so there's this whole group of people who are faceless. What about their rights? How are they addressed? How is their healing addressed? How do we respond to them empathetically? Do they remain faceless? There's their, their compatriots. I will use that term, 
of the families of the perpetrators, of their children, their brothers, their sisters, their parents, their children, their grandchildren, who are also, you know, and are they cooperative or uncooperative? So there's, there's this whole group of people. Um, another theme that is, how is, in fact, then the death penalty, how is it, how is it being used? How has it been, been transformed from how it started? Um, you know, the, 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 European law and America as a penal instrument, and and now how is it used um, in our culture um, for a whole variety? And what's the disconnect between how it's used and what actually happens to um, the surviving victims? Uh, those are oh. two pieces I, I, I'm hearing. Am I, am I? What am I missing, Dave? What am I missing, Rennie? And what we're saying here summarily. Uh, you know, I, I don't think, I, I think that's accurate. I mean, the death penalty is a sanction that's reserved for not the worst of the worst, but for the people with the worst lawyer. It's part of a, you know, the death penalty system in our country is broken. The death penalty system often, you know, divides families over this issue of death at a time when you need solidarity and need each other. The death people, you know, families break apart because of the, you know, dis, you know disagreements over whether somebody should be put to death. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's I think it actually is much, it's a distraction from trying to meet the real needs of victims. Right. And, and Dave, is it any other piece in this that, that, that I have omitted you know, from our conversation in summary? Oh, I think you've both framed it beautifully, and at least in terms of my understanding. Um, I just, you know, want to say that I think, you know, this concept of healing goes beyond um, I guess personal psychology or personal needs. I think Absolutely. that you know there is a, is a kind of woundedness that that affects whole communities and, and in some sense our whole country. If you think of 9/11 and and you know the fear and the responses that came out of all of that, that um, somehow we need to reestablish the in the aftermath of violence that the, the sort of sense of connection. I remember hearing someone from the Department of Justice say crime is inversely proportional to social cohesion, and mm -hmm. um, I think that you know the death penalty system, our political system, has evolved, our culture has evolved to a point where we're we're more divided than together, and I think that's a real problem. What comes to mind imagery wise about that is one of my little patients brought me. Um, I guess they're called Russian nesting dolls. Mm -hmm. And within the doll was a doll, within the doll was a doll, within the doll was a doll. And at the core of that little doll is what I kind of say, what I, what I worked with her with, was that this is kind of our personal psychology. But that psyche is it was within this larger body. And that body is within this larger body of family, within this, however we define family. And that's within this larger body of community, within this larger body of place, of culture. And the healing and the ripples go go right through it, right through it. It certainly made a whole lot of sense to her. That's why she brought it to me. Um, and she was just a wee thing. Well, with, with that thought, I'm going to move on here a little bit. We just have a few minutes left. So to those who listen uh, to this, um, part of what I'd like folks who listen to think about is, as you think about these issues, if they move you, if they inform you, uh, however, however they do, um, I can just imagine some of my uh, dis disabled, uh, chronically ill, uh, different folks saying, boy, you know, that, that the, the, the being the good victim, the bad victim, the, the good witness, the bad witness is like being the good patient, the bad patient uh, in our culture. Um, where do we work? Are we advocates? Do we write? Do we make music? How, how, do, how, do, we, how do we express? What do we do? Um, here are just some thoughts that I always find useful, um, a tremendous willingness to fail. As we look back on those earlier capacities, what I admire about you, Rennie, and you, Dave, is you know, putting yourself out there, taking those risks, seeing what's going to happen. Um, that's, uh, boy, does that help us develop self-reliance. And the importance of community, those nesting dolls. Um, you know, the three of us are talking, how do we extend this community out? And when we don't feel we can persevere, how do we borrow from the strength, the faith of others, however we define it? Allow yourself the time or the help to do the difficult things. We don't have to do this in a vacuum. We shouldn't. 
um, old quote, fall down seven times, get up eight. Future meetings. Um, uh, if you come to this website, communications, uh, you know, you, you can send an email to us here, communications at albanyhealthmanagement.com. Um, if you want more for more information, please go to albanyhealthmanagement.com, communications at albanyhealthmanagement.com. Um, we're going to uh, post this webinar. Um, if, uh, if, if there's other materials we hopefully can put up, Rennie, if you'd like to uh, give us any information about your legislation or your conference, we'll happily post that too. Dave, Dave's done a, tons of interesting good work too and, and the death penalty, his, his work in the arts and poetry. Um, and we're interested